Syra Gorlick, and I'm going to do something different this time. I'm actually going to read uh, some things that I've been writing, and I'll see how it goes. And this is on my website, uh, Atlantis Learning Community. Um, by the way, on this trademark, I'm that just has been approved. That's going to be registered. I, I, it passed the cycle, and we're just waiting for. Um, the government noticed that I can change that to register, which I think is cool. Um, so in terms of learning community, I've been working a lot on the learning community. A couple of people are showing real interest. And I've had some people show some interest, so that that's good. I've got a couple of people that um, seem to, to be picking this up. So I've been writing on the learning community architecture, and here's what I've gotten. So let me read, just read this. At the time of Ben Franklin, it might have been possible to read all the important books on a particular subject. That is impossible today. There is just too much information with an easy reach of everyone. I've read that, that there's 2.5 billion gigabytes of data generated every day in 2012. Um, you know, and that, that's a good example we're going to talk about. I don't know if that's a fact or not, but I've read that. It seems like a lot. And then, then another um, piece of information is, and about 75% of that data is unstructured, coming from sources such as text, voice, and video. And by the way, we're going to talk about facts and, and conclusions later, but this is a good example. Um, I, I know there's a lot of data, whether 2.5 mil billion gigabytes is the right amount of data that's generated every day, I haven't a clue. But orders of magnitude, I believe it's that high. And I also believe that 75% of data is unstructured coming from sources of text. And this is something where if somebody did some research to find that that number is too high or too low, obviously we would want to consider it. So this is uh, just this is just data. Uh, I'm gonna I'm going to assume these are facts for now um, because it doesn't affect my decision or 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 what we're trying to accomplish. So filtering and focusing, the key to optimally using all this information that's out there is filtering and focusing. This is the same thing radios do when they tune a channel. They filter out the noise and focus in on the carrier signal. Um, in fact, if you've ever seen the movie Contact, um, they actually talk a lot about that in the movie. The platform I've created to do this filtering and focusing is called a learning community. So that's, that's the idea of a learning community. It's identified by three things. It's made up of small groups of interested individuals. How small is going to depend on the context of the learning desired. They use an agreed-upon communication process that facilitates the optimal movement of information between people. They share an intent to solve problems by finding optimal solutions. Um, now I want to just give you an example of how, a physical example of what I'm talking about, um, because I'm, I'm going to use the telescope and mobile networks, uh, mobile cellular net wireless networks, as two great physical models that illustrate this filtering and focusing. In both cases, over time, we found that one large lens or mirror in a telescope or one large radio transmitter in mobile networks was too limited. In both cases, we found that by breaking the process down to small cells and then linking the cells together, we can improve the, the, the telescope and mobile networks by many orders of magnitude. And, and, and that's critical. Um, the same, I think, can be applied to learning. At one time, a school and a, with a library and a teacher was sufficient for any community. But as the quantity of information and the ability to access information exploded with the domestication of the electron in, eight, in the 1800s, having one large school was no longer optimal. So, just as the telescope and mobile networks found that breaking down the information processing to small cells and linking the cells together, so too can learning be improved by breaking the learning down into small communities of interest and then linking those communities together. And then I've got some pictures of the telescope here that I think is cool. That was, I think, Galileo's telescope. It uses the lens. And then they went from when that could only get so big, they went to a mirror. Um, mirrors could get pretty big. This is the 200-inch, I think, at Palomar in, in, in California. But then eventually they went, and this is the Keck Observatory, they went to tying a bunch of smaller mirrors together. Um, cellular networks are the same. Uh, they started as one big wireless phone system, and you can only, you know, in, in a market like in LA, it would be put on Mount Wilson, it broadcasts to the whole city, and you can only have limited number of calls. But once we took each tower and put it into a cell and, and reduced the power of the cell, but then found a way to tie the cells together, we were able to actually increase the amount of, of, uh, of traffic. Um, so, 
This is a, a, a diagram I have of a, an old story. It's the elephant. Uh, the elephant being examined by four blind men. Uh, the one holding the nose thinks it's like a snake. The one that's holding the, 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 the leg thinks it's like a tree stump. The one that's holding the ear thinks it's a sheath of leather. And the one that's holding the tail thinks it's a furry mouse. Um, the point being is that that's reality. In a sense, we are all blind. Uh, we only have so much sight. So the key here is to recognize that these people should all be saying, well, we know we're blind, so based on what, you f what you're experiencing, if we share it, we should be able to paint the picture of an elephant. Okay, so now this is the beauty of the Internet. Let me um, view this page. What had happened is as I went through this, I decided to make some changes. So um, here are the changes I made. I added a slide. So I was talking about the um, blind men, but then I added this slide right here, um, this slide, where I talk about raw data, generated facts, conclusions, and recommended actions. So I mentioned it up here, data, facts, and conclusions. So what I've done here is, is refine that a little bit. So, when you look at the blind man and the elephant, the action may be to move this thing. But we know we're all blind, so we need to work together to find out what this thing is so that we can move it. So, you have raw data, generated facts, conclusions, and recommended actions. Um, so this process is pretty straightforward. The community captures as much raw data as it can. Individual members of the community study the raw data for facts. The facts are accumulated, and based on those facts, conclusions are drawn with the intent of action. Uh, this is somewhat like a funnel, um, though it's not exactly because a couple of pieces of raw data can generate a lot of facts and a lot of conclusions. Um, so let me do some a couple of modifiers here. Uh, the first one is, if no intent to action exists, then the effort should not be made. If you know you're not going to change the way you drive to work, there's no reason to research different ways to drive to work. Um, now, in reality, we have so many things we need action on that it's, we, we find more than enough things, so chances are you'll never work on something that needs no action. But I think it needed to be said and actually can require dif dis additional dis discussion on that uh, for people who are working or, or finding conclusions that just confirm their existing beliefs. But we need to talk about that a little differently. Second one is there will always be more raw data than you can optimally store and process. So accept that you will not get it all. So that, that's important. Like right now, there's a lot of data out on the Internet that, that would be helping me here. But, you know, I can't get it all. Uh, the next three are, are sort of tied together. Data is objective. The data can be stored as zeros and ones in a computer. And by making multiple copies, you can determine that any particular group of data was the raw data that you had. In other words, if I take a picture and I've got a 20 meg file, I store that file. Then if I store it in three other places, I can go back and look and make sure that those bits in the first place were the same as the, the original bits. Uh, facts, however, are somewhat subjective. Uh, and we need to talk a lot about that, but that's very important. Um, and so the learning community puts into place um, mechanisms whereby we can reduce some of that subjectivity. You'll never reduce it all, but there are ways to reduce some of that. And finally, conclusions are totally subjective. Uh, they should be taken as much, they should be taken as such and not try to make them objective. Um, and then finally, the actions test of the process. Um, or the actions test the process. If the actions yield the desired result, then the conclusions can be considered valid. However, recognize that I can form a conclusion that yields a result for five years, but then all of a sudden could not um, because things could change. Um, finally, then, I just want to, and of course, I've got a lot more detail. I just, this is a high level. Um, finally, I want to talk a little about the, the physical architecture, um, standard internet architecture like any star um, with the private networks and then with a public cloud. Um, and by the way, obviously, from a technical standpoint, the, the clouds are using everything is the same inside the cloud. It's just that's a virtual cloud. And it could be a physical cloud, though. Don't, don't get me wrong. And that's somewhat important. important. So let me leave it at there. Um, does any of this make sense? I'd be glad. I'd be love to hear from you to know if anybody's actually paying attention to this or if I'm on the right track or how we can make it better. Thanks.